help offered. That's been our theme looking at Sunday for our adult class, combined adult class online. I want to really stress that through these series of lessons to show the practicality of the Bible, that it provides us some solutions to things that we may face, not necessarily that we're facing right now, but that we may come in contact with and some passages that we can go back and refer to. If you have your Bible, we're going to be in Philippians, the fourth chapter, and we're going to pay attention to what Paul writes in verses 10 through 19. Again, Philippians chapter 4, 10 through 19. Today, I want us to focus on learning to be content. Learning to be content. Some questions as we go into this is, how can we protect our heart from the materialistic culture that we live in? It is difficult, especially with access to internet, and advertisements on our phones and things that pop up when it comes to how things are advertised. You know, I don't know about you, but if you see a commercial about a particular restaurant and they're maybe the burger or the fries just look just so perfect, you think, well, I'm hungry. I got to go get something to eat. Or maybe see some ice cream and you think, oh, it just sounds so good right now, man. <sighs> to go get some. You know, a lot of times we never entertain the thought of doing anything until it comes into our mind because of advertisement. Well, how can we protect our heart from not overindulging ourselves in the things? Another question is, what are some ways that you currently right now show contentment? How are you demonstrating that? What are some areas of your life that you find you know, more self-control and discipline when it comes to contentment. The last question I want us to think about in kind of preparing our minds for this lesson is, what should be our attitude regarding our circumstances? I feel great when it's vacation, when I'm at the beach and hearing the ocean and going out and swimming in it and walking on the sand. Whew. That's a great moment, and that's rejoicing, and yes, Lord, this is the day you've made. And it feels so good when we were quarantined for a while, and kind of, you know, one day after the another, and hey, what, what, what are we going to do tomorrow? The same thing today. It was kind of hard to, to, to have that joy, that same intensity that we had if you're on vacation or doing something fun, but doesn't the Bible stress that? In Psalm 118, verse 24, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. You know, that means every day, right? A day that God has given us, a day that we've been blessed with, and that should help lead us into our attitude and how we deal with that. In Philippians, the fourth chapter, beginning in verse 10, it reads, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the length you have received your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to be abound in any and every circumstance. I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Now, verse 19, my God will supply every need of yours according to the riches and glory of Jesus Christ. Point number one is this, understanding contentment. Paul said, I've learned to be content. 
At the time of this writing, he was in prison. He was a prisoner in Rome. He references that in chapter one of verse thirteen, so that it will become evident to the whole guard, palace guard rather, to all the rest, that my chains are in Christ. You know, don't know what it's like to be a prisoner. Don't know what it's like to be confined twenty four seven, as Paul was. And I would assume that it was not a pretty, it's not a pleasant experience. It's something that I would think would be even more difficult to seek joy, seek contentment, seek happiness in a sense, or state of it. But Paul, regardless of the freedoms that he did not have at that time in his life, he still was able to be content. That gets my attention. It's one thing to have someone sitting on a throne an earthly throne, having everything, everybody approach him and give to him at his or hers beck and call, it's much different when someone is in hardship and still maintaining the attitude that we need to possess. If Paul can do that, if Paul can learn and be content as a prisoner, then we can learn contentment as well today. The Greek word for content that in our English translation comes from a word that means this. It means to be self-sufficient, to be satisfied, to have enough. Paul had learned to be satisfied, to have enough, not in himself or because of himself, but because his relationship in Christ Jesus. I love what he said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ. It is nevertheless that I, Paul, who lives, it is Christ who lives in me. You see, I think there's a key to that and what Paul is saying both in Galatians and in Philippians. <clears throat> that Christ and contentment go together. I believe that the most contented people in the world should be Christians. Why? Because they're special? Because they're better than everybody else? No, because they're different. How are they different? In Christ and not in themselves. The Stoics at the time when Paul lived, the Stoic philosophers, they had a very different view of contentment. They believed that all reality, everything around us is material, and we need to put aside passion uh, extravagance to achieve true freedom. It reminds me in studying and, and looking at Hinduism um, and studying ancient religions, the Hindus have a group, a hierarchy, but a special spiritual group known as the ascetics. And the ascetics are holy, holy people that have uh, remove themselves from not wanting anything in this life and saying no to things. And they look it by depriving themselves of things in this life. And it's not what Paul is advocating. This is not the contentment that what Paul was writing about. Because Paul wasn't mo passionless and Paul didn't show the attitude, well, I don't care. Obviously, what I just read for you, he's thinking the church in times past of their gift while he was in Macedonia and Thessalonica and very grateful for them. His passion for the Christ, for me to live as Christ and die would be a gain. He says that in Philippians chapter one. He was very passionate. He's very, showed a lot of compassion towards, towards the Lord, towards his church. And he cared a lot of being a prisoner, still writing this out, taking the time and effort to do this. He showed a lot of care for the church. Point number two is this, the secrets in contentment. I go back and look at verse 10. I see the point, confidence in God's care. I rejoice in the Lord greatly. The joy that he had as a prisoner in Rome was greatly because of the Lord. Um, he goes on to say that even though you're unable to provide, you did show concern. The embassy of the church at Philippi demonstrated God's care for Paul. You recall the, 
the beginnings of it in Acts chapter 16, which is a great chapter in the book of Acts. Paul and his companions, they convert Lydia and those that were with her being the first converts there, establishing the church. And as that time progressed, Paul uh, helped a, a slave girl at the time that had a spirit. The owner was very upset because that was his money maker. Uh, that was his fortune teller where he profited off the spirit that possessed her. And he had Paul flogged and he had Paul thrown into prison. While in prison, Paul and Silas, they prayed as they were shackled and gave praises to God. And there was the great earthquake, the shackles removed, the jail cells doors open, and the prisoners were able to escape. And that's where they were able to reach the Philippian jailer and his family. In that moment of hardship, being flogged, being in prison, because of helping someone out that God still was providing for Paul. That Paul through that God through Paul in these circumstances was reaching people that maybe Paul would never have reached if it wasn't for him being in that circumstance. You look at your life and think about God providing for you in moments and times where the moment's not pleasant, the circumstance is not pleasant, but but maybe the people that you encounter, you never would have encountered them or could be an example to them or shine your light to them if it wasn't for that moment. The church at the time, as Paul was writing this, they, they, they lacked the opportunity to help Paul at that moment in time, but, but their concern was great. The point is that Paul was showing confidence that God in his sovereign care he was content to do without or with, and he was basing that on God's timing. He didn't appear to panic from the reading. He didn't appear someone trying to man manipulate a situation, manipulate, attempt to manipulate God or the church and his rewards. Um, you know, you really should be given to me. You know, I'm, my situation, I'm in prison. I'm a prisoner. You're not. He didn't do that. You know, Paul, you know, showed confidence in God, regardless. What about our confidence in God today at this moment? Do we demonstrate confidence in God no matter what the day may present? We need to do that. We've got to live by faith. We've got to trust and obey. We really can't fulfill those two spiritual qualities characteristics unless we're in moments to where we have to really apply those things in our life another secret to contentment is this being satisfied with a lot no be satisfied with little in verse 11 he says now that i'm speaking of not being in need for i've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty, hunger, abundance, and need. What is our needs? Food, clothing, shelter, godliness with contentment. These things are needs. Paul, again, as you think about this, he he was content with basic necessities of life. I want you to think about our culture and the advertisements and commercials. Can you imagine watching around <clears throat> after Thanksgiving or even leading up to Thanksgiving, the holiday season in full force, watching commercials? Well, you know, we have this great product, but, you know, if you really can't afford it or if it's going to uh, put too much on your budget, then we suggest you wait and wait for, for to purchase it later when you have a better time. Or maybe saying that, no, you don't really deserve this. I know this is a want and not so much of a need. No, they don't do that. They, they, we hear things and like, well, you <clears throat> get something that, that no one gave you. Get something that you really want. Get something that you deserve. You'll love it. You need it. To protect ourselves, we must pay careful attention 
to wherever the word need is attached. Pay attention to how we talk. Well, I, I need to, do we, is that really a need? I want to. Now maybe, maybe the things that we say we need are not really a need, but they are a, but they are a want. The third secret of contentment is this. We are sustained by a greater power. It is through Christ who gives me strength. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13. Christ was Paul's source of strength to endure the unpleasantness, the hardship, the difficulties, the withouts of life. We can find the same strength as well in Christ when we find ourselves in valleys, in moments, on days when it was something that we could not fix on our own. I'm always reminded, it seems, since it happened, being laid up in the neuro ICU five years ago, the summer, and just not knowing how many we get out of this, it's, it's beyond my control, really depending upon God as I laid there in that bed. You know, it was... Is a moment that I don't want to go back to. It's, it's, it's still unpleasant to think about and even sometimes to talk about. But I, I don't want to take away, nor am I, am I thankful, rather, for what I learned and gained through God's sovereignty and God's care and God giving me the strength that's beyond what I could do and my ability in that moment. The fourth thing, the secret to contentment is this. Focus on the well-being of others. That's right. Yeah, you have problems. Yeah, you have things that are going on in your life. Yes, you got this and that. But guess what? So do other people. We should be in the business of thinking about not just ourselves, but others as well. You know, you don't expect contentment because... We don't, we demand the world to, to exactly to be as we want it to be. That's not how contentment works. The world's not going to act or behave as you want. Sometimes even relationships, family relationships, people are not going to do exactly what you think they should do or want. Even everyone in our society and culture is not going to fit into your niche. In other words, the stars are not going to just align just perfectly for over 7 billion people to for everybody to do exactly what they want to do for them to achieve contentment. Paul, in his circumstances, obviously he didn't want to be a prisoner. Who wants to be a prisoner? Who wants to rejoice over being a prisoner in a sense, I'm glad I'm here. I can finally get some rest. No. Paul was, you know, reflecting a little bit on his state, but for the purpose of shifting the thought to the people that he's writing to. You read Philippians. The majority of the letters for who? Is it for Paul? Is it about Paul? Is it about his circumstances? Is it about what Paul's days are like and what he's going through? Or is it about the church and what they were doing? And about him praising them and loving them and encouraging them and praying for them? Paul was concerned for the church. He was concerned for their well-being, for their spiritual state. I love, as he said <clears throat> about them, he mentions in verse 18, I have received full payment and more, and I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. My God will supply every need of yours according to the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. My God will supply your needs. God, Paul was concerned for their needs. In verse 17, he says, Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. The gift that I received from you is not so much I'm wrapped up in the gift that Epaphroditus brought. It's, it's the, what's behind the gift. It's the reason for the gift. It's, it's the people involved in the gift that they may increase according to their credit. You see, Paul prayed for the love for one another, for the church there to be abundant in Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. 
In beginning chapter 2, he told them not to be selfish or conceited, but be humble in mindness in regarding one another. All of those can refer to we need to focus our attention. Sometimes we can be so focused on ourselves, how our life is different, what we have to do and don't do. My wife is so good to remind me sometimes when I get frustrated and just, uh, especially lately, just think this is, this seems unpleasant. She says, Josh, two things. You, we all have our health and we have a job. And I can't argue that. That's so true. Again, Paul was interested in their spiritual blessing and who they were. I love how Paul and what he writes here. And I love how practical it is. I love as we can apply these things to helping us to be satisfied and to have enough. And understand the difference between want and need. And you understand the importance of spiritual rather than the physical. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your, your patience, your mercy, your grace. We are grateful for forgiveness. And I pray that you forgive us for the things that we may fall short of in doing. Uh, we want to please you and glorify you and lift you up. We are so thankful for your word and for its practicality and for it. we are able to read it, understand it, and apply it. We thank you for that. Thank you for the lesson today. And I just pray that it will be a blessing to us and how timely it can be for us to, uh, to be satisfied and to know that we have enough and to count our blessings. And that all coming from the source being you and you're, you're, you're graciously giving to us. Father, we continue to pray that we can just focus on the day, be grateful that it's a day that you've made, and just uh, um, do what we can do, and then, and again, lean on you in all things. We pray all these things, Father, in your Son's precious name.